talk before the noon, before lunch, is, is from Herr Flipke. And according to his mini CV, he works as a translator between machines and humans. Uh, today he's going to talk about uh, some, some bots and probably their security issues and uh, oh, no. how, to, how to crack them, how to make them talk. Maybe. No. Close. Okay, then, then, let's give a hand and for work. Okay. So, so, so everyone who expected like fire-breathing piles of metal, I have to disappoint you. It's mostly software robots. <laughs> okay, so we lost one. Um, so yeah, I am the psychotherapist. Please describe your problems. I have to give a talk at Force Asia. Why do you say that? Bots do exist, but they are a funny concept to many. Is it because they are funny concepts to many that you came to me? Yes. I see. Well, what makes you believe so? The term is used very differently by different people. Some think they are brand new, others have known, built and used them for, for a while, even for decades. Earlier you said they are fuzzy concepts to many. Yes. Hmm. So are you sure that it is so? Yes, because people talk about them using different terms, making very different and sometimes wrong assumptions, and draw strange conclusions. Does it bother you that people talk about them using very different terms and making diff very different, sometimes wrong assumptions, and draw strange conclusions? Yes, since it shows that the phenomena is culturally not very well understood. This in turn enables misguided decisions based on ignorance. When did you first know that the phenomena is culturally not very well understood? This in turn enables misguided decisions based on ignorance. People talk about bots as if they have agency, which they do not have, mostly. Um, they ascribe a lot of power to them without understanding the underlying principles. It reminded me of how humans invented gods to explain thunderstorms. People spoke about bots like humanized technology which is responsible for a, lot of, for a lot of the unpredictability in the world. Um, and they also, use, they also use phrases used with Gnosticism, which made me think a lot. Maybe your life has something to do with this. <laughs> well, I, I have been explaining humans to machines and machines to humans for, for the better half of my life now, so I do see misconceptions reoccurring. You have your mind on machines, it seems. Yes, I, I do like their power as they are, when they are used for the good of humanity. And I'm scared when, when of them when I ponder how much suffering they can enable by the sheer scaling and uh, contributing to the bystander effect. Is the fact that, uh, that much suffering they can enable by the sheer scaling and contribution to the bystander effect the real reason? Are you a bot? What do you think? Currently, I think so. Do you really think, currently you think so? <laughs> yes! Be because I have read your source code and started the execution. Does the fact that you have read my source code and started the execution explain anything else? Dot, dot, dot. So, this talk is titled The Common Bot as if there is a prototypical bot, which there isn't one. Um, they are usually a set of characteristics that get embodied into the world to different degrees. But the smallest common traits of all these things, of such computer programs basically are that they are persistent, that they have autonomy, and they are reactive in their nature. Bots tend to be triggered by, by something, either time or machine readable events, and then they produce some output based on it. And it's, a, a simple bot might just tell you every time the International Space Station passes overhead, and that's okay, but all this is often wrapped into a conversational interface. So I will, uh, I will still run with the idea of, of species and to make more sense of the whole, to make the whole topic more, more approachable. So, so let's look at the tree of life spawned by a simple hello world. Hello world, the start of most programming journeys, is actually already a computer speaking to humans. It is not just some bland number crunching, it is a greeting which is addressed to everyone and everything. Um, at, at least on Spaceship Earth, like hello universe is like a grand stroke to start your career with. Um, so, so, so is Hello World already a bot? Most deny it, and, and yet it is the amoeba of, of computers having a conversation with humans. So, so one of the most prominent examples historically 
of human perception clashing with electronic brains is ELISA, which is a program which was written by Joseph Weizenbaum in the 1960s. You have actually seen ELISA in action at the beginning of the talk. Um, the program is basically two loops that are intertwined, processing language in a very simple way, and it's simple enough to be adapted to very different environments, hence I was using Emacs in the beginning. And, and indeed it's astonishing on how people reacted to it, and they even expected psychiatrists to be replaced by a simple cell script on a large scale. Um, this, th there was some indication for that, since humans did develop a personal, sometimes very private relationship with Eliza, but on the other hand, like, what is your approach to the world if social and emotional labor can be replaced by a simple mechanical parody? So even decades ago, it became apparent that humans tend to exaggerate properties of technologies they don't understand, especially when it's outside their domain of expertise or day-to-day -day experience. Machines up to the 1960s have always been primitive extensions of physical human abilities, like robots basically just pushed things around. That, that was it for the most part. Even calculators were used since, uh, since 1623, but they have mostly been similar to clockworks, like here by Blaise Pascal. Um, yes, they're complex, and yes, they may be made of silicon, but they were still a very predictable composition of discrete parts, and they were very, very well understood. Humans grasp how to use pulleys and levers to extend their physical capabilities. Primitive labor became easier and even automated to some degree. But, but the computer was not just another new thing used by humans, it was actually taking on the management floor of the human self. People were looking at the amazing feat of Eliza and were only able to explain it by drawing parallels how they would be able to accomplish those things, i.e. the human process of thinking. This not very sophisticated pattern enabled the projection of everyone's favorite utopia and dystopia onto computers. This was not only the case in academic circles. In the late, the late 20th century is littered with the trope of the electronic versus the natural brain. Pop culture gave us the eerie neon illuminated computer world of Kraftwerk, time traveling killing machines, and the sentiment, I can count every stars in the heaven above, but I don't have, but I don't have a heart, I can't fall in love. So the perception of, of bots in the early 2017 is heavily influenced by popular media and often in an adversarial tone. As someone who spent a lot of time with bots and used them, I enjoyed Eggdrop and Megahall and IRC, if that's a reference for anyone. Um, also spent a lot of time in different subcultures. I, I can't help but look at the current reporting on, on social bots as a kind of moral panic, similar to things that happened in the early 90s when, you know, when there was supposedly a Satanism, uh, Satanism craze. Anyway, news agencies are, are fine with using good bots like QuakeBot, which just generates reports on, on earthquakes and draws maps, or the BBC weather forecast bot, there's also a Singaporean equivalent. Um, but they condemn bad bots, which supposedly swing elections. Yes, automating a hate machine is distasteful to say the very least, but yet it has been coming for a long time and is an offspring of increased digitization, albeit a cancerous one. So people seem to be surprised by, by the scale of machine-generated content, but digitization enables botification. More and more communication is machine read and writable, so, so using a computer to do both is just where the whole inertia of this system is heading at. Narrowing the communication channel down also reduces the barrier of, of entry for automation. A face-to-face -face conversation between humans is based on a lot of subtle clues and not just the pure information being transmitted in speech. But all that gets stripped away when you use 140 characters in a tweet. And 140 characters, like, humans can still express themselves in it, but also this map is simply enough to be, to be used by a bot. And like, generating 140 characters, meaningful characters, is a task you can conquer on a weekend. It's, it's not that hard. And, and an API on, on the service level, like on Twitter or Facebook, basically screams to be used and, and making digital service an, an integral part of almost your day-to-day -day life and social fabric, of course, invites machines to take part in it. And also computing power is cheap. 
there's plenty of bandwidth, and everyone can pick up a programming language these days. And there are even services like Cheapbots Done Quick or Airbot.io, which, which, which help you do all this. And even here in Singapore, there's Boss Uncle, who gained some notoriety. OK, I see some people reacting to it. Um, and there are actually companies like Narrative Sites, which sell auto-generated content. And if you're interested in how to build bots, there's also a session at 2.30 at the Digital Design Studio, I think. So going back to, to IRC, Actrop, which had this nice logo, is a bot that basically sits on your IRC channel, so basically where you hang out with your friend. And it, it automates a lot of the administrative tasks, like uh, managing your channel, greeting newcomers, doing statistics, and so on and so on. Mega Hall, I also mentioned earlier, is, is a kind of different breed. It also hangs out with your friends, but it picks up different languages, uh, different phrases, learns the tone, and tries to create new utterings from it, which is highly entertaining. Um, if you've never been on IRC, the underscore ebox bots on Twitter are basically the same phenomenon. So they are sort of the, the cheap entertainment branch of the bot empire. Gitbot on, on Reddit, for example, is, is just a simple single purpose script. It just corrects the use of the word skit, since most people probably mean sketch. And if you're not into stand up comedy, you probably not know what I'm talking about, but I recommend you look into it. <laughs> there are also activists bot on Twitter, which leverage the, the political nature of technology. There are bots like Congress, Eddings, uh, Congress Edits, Bundes Edit, Farmer Edits, like shown here. Or, or oil elements, which bring forward the little changes that are made to Wikipedia by powerful real-world actors. Farmer edits, for example, just like tracks the IP ranges of pharma companies and always spouts out when someone changes this. Here, for example, Pfizer has edited the World Grand Prize on Wikipedia for some ex on the list of companies in Pakistan. Okay. And you can, of course, you can, can still convey the same information by, by staring at all the recent changes in Wikipedia, but you can also just like Use some JavaScript, put a filter on it, and put it on Twitter. And what do you think is more engaging? And wikis are actually a prime example of an ecosystem that is conducive to bots. Especially Wikipedia, there's, a, there's just a core media wiki installation, which has about 600,000 lines of code. But there's a lot more code needed to make it function the way it does. Some argue that the, the bespoke code running along this, this platform is actually an order of magnitude more. That, that means six million lines of code are used to sustain Wikipedia as it is. And this is code not run by the Wikimedia Foundation. This is not code running on their service. It's code people wrote customly just to make this ecosystem what it is. The obvious examples of these are bots which counter spam and vandalism but there are more niche applications. But bots do have a profound influence since they are algorithmic in nature, never tiring, always alert if they don't break. Um, and they also enforce how Wikipedia, both the encyclopedia and the community around us, is imagined by programmers. So if you want to get involved with that, there's also try to find uh, three, 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 she's gave a talk yesterday on Wikipedia and she's running around here. Um, so, so speaking of platform and such, of, of course there's art leveraging this medium. There are bots based on simple node modules, ba basically JavaScript like Newsnax, bot utilities, Canvas utilities, level cache tools, and so on. You basically send a message to them and you get a reply, the simple reply bot you often find on, on Twitter. At Unicodifier uh, takes, for example, text and exchanges characters by glitching the Unicode. Bad PNG, which you can, which you can see here, take, is an example of where it just takes in an image and, and spits out a, a glitched version. So, so these bots are on Twitter, but Tumblr seems to be a native habitat. And then also going back to Skitbot I, I mentioned earlier, it has a confederate called BotSkit. And if you're on Reddit, BotSkit reacts to certain phrases in certain conditions. And so what you have in the end is an a theater performance unfolding in front of all the unexpecting users. So all these artboards are like the digital incarnation of the Heath Robinson contraption or Rube Goldberg machine, which are often used to counter the corporate non-personality of the medium. They are funny and non-oppressive, like the breakfast machine we can see here, 
And, and these mechanism, uh, wacky mechanisms had often used, showed up in art, like Duchamp used useless machines in his work. The, one of the most high profile art bots was the one, oh, he is still Random Darknet Chopper by media, uh, media group Bitnik. It's a bot with a budget of like 100 US dollars and it per, of, in Bitcoin per week and it goes on a random sh shopping spree in underground markets. And all the purchases are delivered and present a different ex uh, exhibition. That's why you can see fake shoes and ecstasy, whatever turns up. And this, of course, uh, raises some interesting questions like, is this legal? Who's responsible? Is, can it be considered to be malicious? Which part of the outcome was intended? Are all these setting, are all these questions are, are raised an issue that's open to experimentation and a playful discovery, but they have serious implications down the road once you think about them. And while all, all that sounds, sounds nice and good, there are actually issues creeping in, especially if you offer services. If you look at bot as avatars, then there is a tendency to gender the technology. And it's often expressed in, ex in the way that virtual assistants are feminized. Think about Alexa, Siri, Contana, or Susie. They, they tend to bring up the image of a female-bodied person. Um, and they're also often referred to with female pronouns in the marketing material and have female sounding voices. So this actually reflects a long line of considering un or low paid service work actually as women's work. Apple offered a knowledge navigator back in the 80s as a concept, which was very different from Siri. It was a male voice in an avatar, as you, as you can see in the boy tie, bow tie. It was portrayed as a research assistant, a librarian or information manager, and it definitely not the personal secretary. The aforementioned bots are, are, are marketed as tools for organization and personal, and personal connection. The knowledge navigator was a protective barrier between the user and the domestic sphere, while digital assistants do all the relational work. They do scheduling, check-ins, and remind you to buy flowers. So, so the labor of social reproduction, which was up until recently invisible and, and outsourced to women, is now outsourced to a device. This reproductive labor was not perceived as an effort, purposeful, or even valuable. Now that machines do part of it, it gets reflected back to the male user, and it seems that technology generates more tasks and responsibilities rather than saving labor. It is you who has to tame your email inbox. Now it is you who has sometimes micromanaged your digital assistants, and it is you whose attention gets chopped away between different tasks, and all these were delegated earlier on a higher level. So, so if you build a bot just for fun, just look around you. Which, which cultural frames do you reproduce and, and should they be embodied this way? Like you could, a simple way to do it could be just like choose male, female names just randomly when you've been people sign on to a service. <coughs> it would be a simple mitigation, albeit not a very good one. One of the best strategies overall is just to avoid the human framing around bots entirely. A human-like bot raises a lot of implicit expectations and bots usually fall short of it. When you raise the expectations, you also agree to be judged by a way harsher level and harsher rules. And there are a lot of implicit rules in human, in human social interaction. And as we've seen with Eliza before, humans want to believe in AI, but their hearts are fragile. So perceiving a bot as a proxy for human agency also raises legal issues. Um, having someone acting on your behalf is a common concept around all legal jurisdiction, at least I know of. So if you use a bot to enter contracts, the degree of automation and predictability is actually very important. Enter a, a contract is actually just as easy as buying something or like offering to, to deliver something. And here I want to also refer to the legalese people who gave a talk yesterday and last year if you want to look into machine readable and negotiable contracts. I also want to point uh, to the Sveriges Reichsbank Prize of Intercommunal Science in memoriam of Alfred Nobel, which was awarded in 2000, 2006, 2016 to Oliver Hart and Bengt Holström for their work on contract theory. To, to spoil it for you, contracts are incomplete. So you might want to run damage control on your bots. That also is the same for like whatever utterings they produce. Also, you might want to put away some money for insurance because uh, depending on the nature of your endeavor. Having a public emergency shutdown button is a protection measure Wikipedia opted for. It's, it's aiming at simple bots, both in terms of algorithm implementation and also helps legal issues <coughs> less painful down the road, which, but that's also a different discussion. 
So if you want to know more about building good bots, I have a talk coming up at Reitz, uh, ReitzCon in Brussels titled The Making of a Bot, Considerations for Social Interactions. But I put the references in, in the slide that are online, which are we're going to explore all the issues in depth. So as we have seen throughout the talk, there are, there's a wide variety of bots out there. They are all perceived as having an autonomy and performing tasks previously associated more with humans than with machines, as they are faster and never tiring. Computers are stealing our jobs, finally a viable path to a better society if profits and wealth gets distributed fairly, but I digress. On a more abstract level, bots stitch together disparate platforms, for example, posting different things on RIC, and have done this since the dawn of the internet, and are sometimes quite neat. Bot work is very data-driven, and you can leverage APIs like Wordnik or datasets published by Tate Modern, Wikimedia, your government potentially, etc. So there's also a new literacy needed in this world. The quantified expression, like retreats, etc., are like perfect prey for what is dubbed malicious social bots, which are powerful in numbers, but not on their own. <coughs> so there's no need to be confused by, by the moral panic, and there are techniques to build better bots. These techni techniques are informed by, by history and other fields, as we've seen before. So in, in general, bots, like all software, cannot be reduced just to the code they're composed of, they will always reflect the conditions under which they are deployed and developed. In the end, bots create the illusion of complexity, sort of like stage magic. It can be baffling, disappointing if you find out how it works, entertaining and intriguing, but there's always craft behind it. And this craft is informed by history and can be understood. Its effects reflect the culture, so don't be afraid and shape a better future. Thank you. Two more minutes. Yeah. Ooh, that was faster than I expected. The last five minutes for questions, of course. Are there any questions? So if, if bots is, um, let's say this moves in one direction of personal assistance, yeah. right? that you have got someone who just does some funny, whatever, small task, yeah. but someone who does helps me to manage my whole life. Yeah. Um, in this case, the bot or the personal assistant needs to access to all my data. Yeah. To Help me all my life. Yeah. So how how do you see the trends there? I mean, obviously Google is very good with it because they already have all my data. Um. But I mean, <sighs> there are multiple hearts beating in my chest with that. My my condescending view on the average user says they won't care, since a lot of people already use Google products and use Facebook, which is basically a a commercial entity aiming at like exploiting you and then selling you stuff at the end. It's not a free service out of the good for humanity. Um, I've seen a lot of research in the last few years when it comes to managing personal data based on zero knowledge concepts. So that might be a way so that the bot can still make sort of right decisions, but being oblivious what feeds into it. So that's something I would dig into if that's of your concern. Or would you like to rephrase and specify the question deeper? No, I mean, it's a big question. I, don't, I didn't expect an okay. answer from you. It, it, it but, uh, it's but, but yeah, it, it, hmm? I mean, if, if this thought is this what should help me with my, I don't know, with my, my calendar, my context of birthdays, of my friends, like my health, my, my shopping, my insurance, all my stuff. They need to access to all the data. They need to yes. be connected to all my IoT devices, to all yes. my health tracking devices, to all my personal files, it's calendar, it's everything, all of mm -hmm. my friends, all my communication. It's, it's actually not your data, as you already pointed out in the end. It's also that of your friends. Exactly. Um, there are already simple privacy implications, like people track whether their lights are on in their house or not. But it also means that they know when their spouse is coming home or not coming home. Um, so there's already a simple bit that has potential serious implications, social implications down the road. Um, one way to sort of mitigate is like uh, run something like Nextcloud on your own machine, and then you can can at least be reasonably sure that your personal data stays within your boundary you trust and control. Actually, I'm, I'm thinking about that because I find that the idea of this bot, this personal assistant, that help me with managing my life very compelling, but I don't know if you have control over it. Actually, I've been thinking about adding something like that to Nextcloud because it might 
basically has the beneficial feature without the drawbacks. There's going to be a talk in two weeks at RightsCon, which might help you. <laughs> so. I okay. just wanted to mention that, that if, if you just have it on your, like, in a trusted environment, like if you run your own mail servers, then you can have your bot reading your emails. Yep. And knowing that your flight is going to be at 11.30 and reminding you to book the cab because the bot hasn't seen that there hasn't been any like confirmation of the book the cab yet. Yep. Also, which will help with that is like the increased bandwidth, like the more bandwidth you have at home, the less need is there to like put something on the internet. If, if you need a mental framing around that, think about do you know where a computer is and do you realize when someone steals it? If, if you can't figure that out, then you should probably host somewhere else if you want to entrust it with personal data. Because you tend to get noticed if people kick down your door and point guns at you. Believe me. You notice it's different in a data center. More questions? Everyone's mind blown. Okay. I, I, no, 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 okay sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't know. If you, if you, if you look on the internet and you think about personal assistance, everybody seems to think that personal assistance equals voice recognition. Uh, hmm? Okay, you have to say one thing in the media too. I'm always like puzzled by that, right? Because why? I mean, there are some things I want to do with voice, but a lot of things I don't want to do with voice. Yep. Like, like typing or it's something like a metric screen where I can see like the information, web page or something. It's like also a good way to interact with the system. I don't want to and do everything with voice. I mean, um, it's how, how do you? Use, I mean, Amazon Alexa and uh, Echo and all the stuff is all in Siri. It's all built around voice, but voice is for me just a tiny part of communication. Yes, um, it's it's sort of like biometrics. It's built around the coolness factor. Yeah, like it's, it's 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 really like awesome if you can use your fingerprint to like open your personal safe or to start your car, which is cool. Like and someone, else. yeah, and like n just now, but the actually, no, actually, yeah, no, yeah, no, but no, the fingerprint thing isn't cool. It's actually really really practical. I don't have to go press 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 press. I just go that and it's done. Yeah, and it's that's cool. I have to do this fifty times a day. It saves me a lot. Yes, and that's cool until, until someone chops off your finger. <laughs> <laughs> if someone chops off my finger, as you said before, I notice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have to make a picture. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and, 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 yeah, and then I come to you with a gun and I say, give me your password and you'll give it to me, right? Yeah, but, but, <laughs> yeah, but the, you can do that. as I see that, the, 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 the narrative around biometrics is like, yay, this is the future. But like, if you actually think about it, it's like, how do you replace, replace your fingerprint or your face? Like, you're like, you have to scan your face to get into a high secret, value secret thing. Someone steals your face, which we can all do, just like swing your camera around. Boom, screwed. Then, so, so it's more about the narrative. It's sort of like, I think, self-driving cars. It's like, we have been, we have had Knight Rider in the 80s. So there's an established narrative about around self-driving cars. But everything else, not so much. And also, um, if you look around how personal assistance could be used, and like, as you said, like with a dashboard-like thingy, there has been a lot of research in the 70s, as usual, in Xerox Park, where it's about like ambient information. So there actually is no need to be bothered. Also, especially going back to voice, there are also privacy implications. Like, I, I, I'd much rather prefer typing into a search machine. Weird pain bottom location instead of say hey Siri what are like these weird things I just photographed <laughs> <laughs> so yeah voice by nature is almost always broadcasting but text isn't usually yeah. it also depends on your culture so if, if only you're in Japan there's no way on earth anyone will say anything on a train it's an end time yeah but if you're in New York City people are yelling at each other in the subway so who cares Yes, but, but still, it also is, again, humans clashing with machines and how different cultures imagine machines and humans and also their fellow beings. Okay, let's do uh, a round of applause for So this was the end of the before noon sessions talks and our next talk will be at half an hour. Uh, and Mesha Das will be talking about licenses in Python. So.